So um, I'll go ahead and get started if we're ready. Um, that's funny. Deanna just texted me about Sarah saw Tom Grace's art. <laughs> I'm like, I will get to you later. Um, so yeah, as you already know, we're going to talk about character design and uh, how I approach things personally. Uh, a lot of the projects that I've done in the past um, have a lot to do with um, kids stuff. So I, I've done a lot of stuff, a lot of properties from kids properties to like adult horror properties and, and you know costume design and stuff like that. But I was going to show you before we went into how I develop. Uh, I'd just like to show you guys. So you guys have probably seen it a lot, but I just kind of want to go over it with you. Let's see, I just want to present. I'm just going to do it through my website. It's, it's easier. Um, go to my concept art. So a lot of my earlier stuff that I was doing was uh, more like this. Uh, a lot of the leapfrog, um, kids gaming, gaming stuff. Um, this is Tyrone the T-Rex. <laughs> uh, it's for a game called T-Rex Rush. And uh, if you look up top here, I had to do these different uh, Tyrannosauruses in these different styles here. Um, I, sh I should have got one where I can zoom in, but uh, one has kind of like a flat color, more of a skinny shape. Some have like the bigger heads because they want it to be cute. Uh, and once it was selected, we did like little accessories and like, you know, slight turnarounds, uh, backpack, uh, head glider, and then we went into color here. But um, one of the things you notice when it comes to children's properties uh, things are bigger, eyes are bigger, shapes are, are bigger and more, I don't want to say more interesting, but uh, more appealing to its age group. Um, let's take this for instance here. Um, actually, I wish I knew where the big version of this was. Uh, let's try this. There we go, much better. Uh, I, I'm, that might be hard to see, um, but if you look over here, uh, these were just different shapes that I was doing for each creature, uh, and every single one I did, I just tried to keep it just interesting, something that a kid would like or want to play with, um, nice little, just big shapes, like the nose here, it's kind of round, the big buck teeth on this little weird rat-looking creature. Um, then when I got feedback from all of these, we ended up coming up with these guys here that you see. Like this fish has like little antennas on his head and the slug has the eyes coming out of the top of its head instead of underneath. Um, we got the electric guy and the vegetable guy, uh, but all of them are just have very friendly shapes, if that makes sense. <laughs> I'll take this kind of to a midway point here. Though it's not complete concept art because it was finished art used for a game. Um, it's the same with this character. I had to kind of keep it kind of cute um, because it was for a certain age group, but there was a style applied to it that I had to follow um, where it actually it was kind of hard because the person who did the last versions of the characters do them in a completely different way than what I'm, I'm used to. So I kind of sort of had to match the style, but I think we're going to go back and redo them all the way I do them. Um, but for this, I had to go more painterly. There wasn't a lot of flat colors there, uh, but I still maintain those rules. Like the basic rules still, uh, still stay. Like the big kind of kid friendly shapes here, the big head, the, the big fat tail. And it, it, it's all the same rules different method here. But then, once you start getting into more cinematic design and conceptual art, 
Uh, I'm going to start with like some regular clothing here. This is where you're not necessarily designing the people. You're designing like what they're wearing and you know what the, the outfits and what they're wearing. So that's why you see a lot of blank faces and stuff like that. Um, this is more clothing focused, clothing based. So you're not when you're doing something like this. When it comes to normal clothing, um, shape language almost takes a back seat. I know that's kind of like a weird thing to say, but it almost takes a back seat because it's more based around reality and it's normal clothing. Uh, normal clothing can have interesting shape language, but a lot of the time it's very basic, you know, unless you have some kind of really crazy jacket on or some big hat or whatnot. Uh, but then when you start getting into like stuff like this, like these monsters, these, you know, here, this aquatic creature, that's when you're going to start worrying more about shapes, you know, protruding things coming out of them, long fingernails, fed feet. Um, it reads well. It reads as a creature. Uh, same with the, his enemy, you know, the wood beast. You know, he's very, you know, has, has the big antlers coming out. He's almost uh, ape-like, the way he's built. Uh, his fingers are weird-looking. Uh, then I did a couple. I did a couple design alternate heads on this side, but um, you know that that sh those shapes are there. They're more threatening. You know, here and here, sharp edges, sharp edges, weird fingers with sharp edges. A little different from our kids' stuff there. So this is leaning outside the kid kid friendly zone. And this is the zone we're going to stick in with my demonstration, so don't worry. We're not going to be designing care bears or anything. Um, show one more example. I want to like show you more. Um, though it was never used, it was just a for a portfolio piece. Um, this would be another example of. Uh, something that would be designed for cinema. Uh, and it's kind of like that halfway point between casual clothing and heavy shape language within that casual clothing. Since this is period clothing, um, I think it, you have the opportunity to give it more, sh uh, like a more interesting shape. Uh, you know, with the outfits, they have the coats have kind of the bigger shoulders here. Um, he has a hook for a hand, so that definitely reads really well. Um, and even his stance, like how he stands, that can give him uh, a very interesting shape too. It's not just like what they're wearing, it's even kind of like how they stand or how they always kind of like their positions or their idle positions, that helps too. Um, and also too, if you see, I did one where he has no coat, uh, another one where he has the coat on, what he looks like, and his turnaround with the coat, like what he would look like from behind. Um, Usually when you do the cinema stuff, that's kind of what they expect from you normally is like that you just do a turnaround um, and then you turn that in. Does anyone have any questions about this so far? Mm -mm. Okay. I think that is all I want to show there. Unless there's anything else you want to see, I'll get out of the website here. So for our character today, um, I made this really brief. And the reason why I made this general um, is to show you like how you can push a design um, as you're, you know, you're doing your uh, concepts, your silhouettes and your roughs and stuff like that. Um, so I kept it very kind of general here. So if you read it, uh, we're doing a character called Lena the Grave Killer. Um, her genre is sci-fi fantasy. So you'll have a little, some elements of both in there. And her description is that Lena is an eight foot tall sentinel with cool skin. She has long dark hair, red eyes, and a few scars on her body from combat. She's dressed in dark clothing and wields a coffin as a weapon, which is powered by the dead. Is that <laughs> sense there? <laughs> so we have everything there we need. We have our description and stuff. And normally if you do something for a client, 
um, there's more to the description. You know, sometimes they'll give you like an age. They'll give you, uh, uh, in some cases, they'll if you're doing something for cinema, they'll send you like a shot of the actor or actress, like their build and stuff. And sometimes you you'll have to just trace right off their build and draw stuff on top of it in Photoshop. Uh, if you look at a lot of the Marvel um, conceptual art for cinema, they literally take pictures of the actors and trace them sometimes and paint them in, and then they paint the uniforms on top of them in Photoshop. That saves them so much time. Like, I, I did that with the Candyman piece. You know, found pictures of Lakeith Stanfield, you know, went off of them, did like a light trace, painted his face, and made clones who just changed to different outfits. Uh, it's all, it's not about, sometimes it's not about making a fancy piece. It's about getting the idea across. So you might have like, you know, day, day and a half at one point, and you might have a week, week, two weeks, you know, uh, other times. So it, it just really depends. So going into this, I'm reading my description. Okay. A little general. So I'm going to throw some ideas out there. So normally the first thing I do is I make what's called a height chart. Um, usually mine aren't this fancy, but I'm just showing you since she's eight feet tall and I have to kind of stick to that. Uh, I made one just in case. So what I have here is what I like to call the base person or base figure. Um, and I, and that's about a six foot person right here. And I keep it at a low opacity, you know, it's just for reference for me. Um, especially when I get down to doing the coffin designs, um, since that's about like your average height, you know, I need to figure out like the equivalent of that coffin size to that person. If, if that makes sense, or right, scale pretty much all scale. So, uh, I usually make one body base like you see here. Uh, it's just one dark silhouette, a hundred percent, uh, opacity. Let me get my love out here now, I feel like it's very at this point in your design don't worry about detail this is going to be all about shapes and making it interesting you know don't think about functionality at this point especially because it'd be more for a game and not cinema when you're doing cinema think of functionality but not very much at this point right now it's about shape and making the silhouette look interesting so what I do is I take this basic shape and I clone it. So I made nine of them, which honestly I only ended up doing six. Don't bust my balls. So what I like, <laughs> so what I like to do is I make I create another layer, and I'll go on top of this uh, base body here. And I just use a regular brush, factory brush, to bring it up to one hundred percent there. So I'll just start creating shapes. Very interesting shapes here. Okay. And use your um, eraser too. Yeah, like don't. Don't be afraid to do that. Sometimes I'll just do these on one layer and I'll just use the background, the gray background just to like, you know, as my eraser. So I can just sample the color and keep going instead of using my eraser and then cutting pieces. I'll usually just use my gray. That's more of a shortcut thing I do. Um, as you can kind of see here, it's all about making her interesting looking. High color or something here. A lot of times I like to do this to I'll take white. Because she has long dark hair. We might want to see 
where like her skin shows. You know, maybe she's there, there, there. That helps me with my design personally. And also, too, if you're using Photoshop, uh, one of the things that can help you uh, work a lot faster, uh, if you press the Alt button, is to sample your colors as you work. Um, it cut my time down tremendously. So when you you'll probably see that icon switch when I work. That's just me sampling. So let's see. I'll do something like this. See if you know I lost my collar there. So I might sample this gray like I was talking about earlier. Cut into it. Just to acknowledge that it's there. Sample that black. And cut behind here. We still know it's long hair, so we again it's just about the shape at this point. Maybe I wanna slim her face down a little bit. Curls down a little bit. Just something. if I look at it from far away I'd be like okay that's cool and all but maybe she needs cooler boots or whatever but maybe she wears a cape I leave that, leave that hollow sometimes uh, but you'll see my examples uh, that I do something different with that, but um, that's more of a you thing. If you choose to leave your back caves hollow or whatnot, that's fine. Uh, that's just something that I do. Um, but again, right now, this is just all about interesting shape, just making something cool, essentially, or, or interesting looking. Okay. So that would be like an example of something I would do right there. I usually just do it on a separate layer. Uh, then I've, you know, uh, link them together or merge them, excuse me, I merge them together. So I'm going to turn this off and I'm going to show you the examples that I came up with. <coughs> so these are the examples that I came up with. Uh, for my design. Can you guys see these okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Does anybody have any questions so far? No. Yeah, you said this was for a video game? Uh, we were, yes, this is like if we were designing this for a game. That's how I'm approaching this. It, it's not cinematic. It'd be more like animation or video game or 3D design type deal. Even though I'm not doing a full, not showing you guys a full turnaround, that's why I showed you a, uh, the turnaround example earlier. Because uh, I'm not be, I'm not going to be doing it here, but normally you would do a turnaround for something like this, front, back, side type deal. For every single one. Uh, no, for the one you pick when you pick okay. your, do your final version. Yeah. Um, but as you can see here, um, I've done I've did six uh, examples. Uh, I tried to keep the coffin designs similar to the uh, the Lena designs that I have to the right of them uh so it says the coffin is her weapon essentially she wields a coffin as a weapon um they didn't see say how the weapon was wielded or what the weapon was so i kind of let my brain just go wild there i'm pretending that this is a client coming that gave me the description here so i just start coming up with all these ideas for what it does or how it's shaped uh is it tethered uh, you can see that I did like a chain design here uh, with arms coming out. Uh, there's one that has like, it's almost like two eyes kind of deal. Um, I, I like the ghost tether here. It's kind of my favorite. Mm -hmm. um, I did almost like a Roman looking design here. It's like her hair is up and there's like this almost like whip with like the uh, sarcophagus at the end of it. 
so it'd like crush you or something if she like slung it at you or something. Um, I did this one, which is similar, I think, to the top here, um, but it's like a spider-like um, version of the coffin that's flipped upside down. I wanted to use that shape, but in a different way. Um, I almost picture it when it opens, it has teeth on the inside of it, and it's like sideways or something. But that's what you would show in like your your turnarounds and your smaller versions to show how the creature moves and everything, which that, I'll get to that stuff later. Um, I did one here with like arms coming out. Again, I kept the design similar with uh, the nice hook there or horn, you know, element there. Uh, this one I wanted to take a different route with because I just really thought that like like this Greek version up here uh, and number two I liked uh, the armor, but I was like I want to add a cape to that. Uh, and I did that, and I did, like, this version that was tethered with, like, a, a spirit chain or something. And if you look closely, there's, like, uh, ghost arms coming out with, like, weapons from inside the casket. So uh, these were different ways that I interpreted interpreted that interpreted, interpreted. <laughs> that, that, that word today. Um, uh, these are the designs that I came up with uh, for the idea. Um, here, this is where I would submit them to the client um, and let them look at them like, um, well, some clients do that. You don't have to do that all the time. Some clients do that where you can send them something like this. Uh, personally, I, my experience was uh, drawing something like this and then I pick the best three or whatnot and then draw, you know, drop them into another file that kind of thing. But again, it really depends on who you're working with and what their pipeline is. All right, so I have a question for you guys. Um, out of these designs here, which ones are your favorite? We're going to do A, B, C, D, E, and F. Uh, I didn't, I should have lettered those or numbered those. Or actually, no, do them numbers, one through six. We'll go, we'll go around the board here. Isaac, which one's your favorite? Two. You like two? Yeah. Eric, what's your favorite? I think I'm going to go with six. Nice. Haley? I like four. Anna? Yeah, I, 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 I like four. I really, I really, really like the coffin on that one. <laughs> Chet, you have one? I think he's muted. I don't know if he's there or not. <laughs> We're so, testing this chat. Are you here? <laughs> I don't think he's there. Um, all right. So, so what I ended here. up doing. Oh, oh so what do you say? I'm still here. No, and no, for we, shape language, I would pick the uh, middle one on the bottom, on the second row. Middle one on oh. the second row. Nice. Okay. I think it's interesting that you guys uh, picked different ones from the set. So uh, that's really cool. Um, so what I ended up doing, um, because a lot of people kind of forget that you can do this in this stage of your conceptual design, and usually this happens a lot too, um, you'll have a client say, these are all great, all great, um, but I really like the design from number two, but I love the coffin from number four. And so, you know, all you can do is go, okay, which changes do you want? So they might say, uh, we want a spirit, a, a spirit chain that you have in number six with number two, uh, number two's figure and then number four's coffin. So they, a lot of the times they'll pick parts from each one and mash, mash them together. Does anybody have any questions so far? Yeah, um, the prompt was pretty short. The idea is we have a client here that wants this. I wonder what what liberties do you give yourselves? Um, so, for instance, these are all a very human figure. There's nothing creature-like about them. No. Um, you you haven't like you know like the the idea of the coffin being the weapon and other things like that. You haven't 
come up with multiple ways that you know, like there's something similar about each of these you know what i mean yeah and yeah. you, you could have gotten really creative and said what if it's like this what if it's like that but that's not really your job necessarily because they probably have an idea of what they want this character to do in the game yeah not rather than you you know so i, yeah. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. well sometimes too you'll get if it's general like this um i kind of relatively stuck with the same idea uh, because I wanted to explore that more. Um, but you might get a client that's like, no, I want it to look like a sword instead. So you got to be like, okay, how the fuck am I going to make this look like a sword? Um, which I do have some ideas of how I'd make that a sword, which would be fucking sweet. But <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> um, okay. yeah, and you, I might have a client come back and say, oh, we like this spider design, but can we have that spider turn into a sword or a giant spear, which would be fucking sweet. Um, it's like, yeah, we can do that. Um, so just, again, it really depends like what the client says or, you know, where, or how general the description is. And then you just kind of go from there. Um, if I did have questions about like, Hey, can I make it a javelin or, or a gun or cannon or whatnot? I'd have to ask the client before I did it. That's normal. That's what I do. Anyway, yeah. You know? Unless I, you know, can't get a hold of the client and I really want to do it, I'll just make a side example of it from the other ones that I do normally, just saying, hey, I tried this, what do you think of this instead? How to do it. Okay. Yeah. Anybody have any more questions? Okay. Turn this off. Yeah, yes. Okay. So what I did here, this is 11 by 17, is I, and as you can see, I took my um, height chart in here with me. Uh, normally, you know, you really don't have to do that. Normally, I would just take these two and just scale them to what size I wanted to draw them. But um, sometimes I just like doing this because you might have other characters that you'll need to design. And using a height chart, uh, sometimes they'll give you like we saw here in this description, even though it was general, she's eight feet tall. She's fucking huge. So you have to keep that in mind when you're designing these other characters too. If that makes any, if that makes any sense. So keeping that height chart really kind of keeps things, you know, kind of in check and how you're designing them. And after you design someone like her, you can make a silhouette of her and use it as a reference to like a shorter character. So step one, uh, I take those uh, concepts and uh, cut those pieces out and I drag them in, as you can see here. From there, I scale them up. I, I like to keep them as smart objects just so they're not super blurry. I mean, that's really up to you if you want to do that, but I'm just, you know, I'm a stickler like that. I like, you know, like to see my edges and stuff. And here, I didn't do, get have time to do the coffin, by the way. I'm sorry. Sue me. <laughs> so here, I have my Lena shape. That I have here. I'm going to zoom in on her a little bit. And from here, I like to make a nice rough sketch. And this isn't super rough. I should have just left all the lines in there, but I got all into it and started erasing a lot of the lines, and then I looked at it and I was like, holy shit, what did I do? <laughs> Why did I do that? I should have left that in there. Um, yeah, so you can see this is still a little rough. Um, I missed a lot of it off our silhouette there, and as you can see, it still helps. I changed a couple things, but as you can see, the overall look and design and shapes are there. Let's see, let's zoom in a little bit more. Okay. So from here, I'll take this sketch and I'll turn off that base layer that we had Alina here. And now we're at our sketch lines there. 
I like to take that down pretty far. And at this point, um, what helps me is I turn off my height chart. I've got what I, uh, I have what I need already just from this information here to just start doing line work so I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, so I bring the sketch down usually to about 15%, uh, which is really light. Um, then I'll create another layer. And I use a factory brush, and I take it down to about 65 because that makes it feel like uh, feel like I'm using an actual pen because uh, it's not 100% like you know on the on the canvas. So it has a little bit of give with that 65%. So I'll come in here and I'll just start doing a little line work like this. Usually, when you're doing uh, line work or something, you're going to paint. Um, I see, some people will do it, some people don't. But uh, I kind of like doing a little bit of weight um, underneath the chins and little areas where white's not going to hit that kind of thing. Does anyone have any questions so far? Mm -mm. Example, what I'm doing. And keep in mind, even after you complete your line work here, uh, I like to turn it off and then refine it again. So that gives you kind of uh, an idea of what I do. And then once I'm done, It'll look something like that. And then I'll turn off my back sketch that I had, or that rough sketch, excuse me, that I had. And I try to keep my lines, again, fairly simple. Because we're going to be painting. So remember, she wears black, right? So we got to put her in black. Uh, one of the things that I looked at with her, and it didn't say in the description, but I wanted to take a chance with her armor, is that I want her armor pieces to look like obsidian. Uh, you guys know what that is, the rock. Mm -hmm. uh, so I uh, finished my sketch here and turn this off. Then I'm going to turn on my color layer. Let me turn this off. So what I started doing is pulling the references. So this is kind of what her armor is going to feel like and look like. What I'm going to try to go for is this obsidian rock here. Um, this chest piece here and her, the, the cloth pieces that she's wearing will be like leather, a quilted leather. Uh, this will kind of have like a quilted leather feel here. I haven't decided if I want to run the pattern this way yet but I can always create another layer and paint on top of that to see what it looks like, which is another thing you'll do a lot in uh, cinematic design. And even in, well, actually all, all the time in conceptual art, you'll just have versions that you'll, that are painted over with the changes that the client asked for. Um, some people can keep their shit in pieces, um, which is good for animation that I noticed too, when you're swapping stuff out. But yeah, it's just, different ways to approach that. Uh, so I'm looking at this and I'm like, okay, well, of course I'm not just going to be working in blacks and grays. You know, she has a, a, a cool tint to her skin. Uh, I assume it's almost like she's dead. So what I like to do, um, I don't call myself a color genius at all. So what I use, I use this tool from this artist named Sykra and it's a color teardrop wheel. And what it does, and this is, I think this is actually in the Clever Kaiju shared folder as well. So if anybody wants it, uh, this teardrop here, you rotate it and kind oh. of it, you'll have a set of colors uh, for you to use. So if I'm doing something that's like a, a desert or whatever, I'm going to lean more this way 
kind of get into like the the hot. Uh, so I'm gonna be like about there if I did desert or uh, something from the desert. Actually, let me. Sorry about that. So, yeah, I'd be like back here if I was doing a desert piece. So I'm going to keep a little bit of that yellow in there, so about like there. So since our hero, or we don't even know if she's a hero, probably a villain, since she's a cooler skin character, we want to go about here. And I think I cho chose a different spot for mine. So, so be about there. Layers, like cookie cutter layers and you're moving it around. That's fun. It's a good yeah, It's a type of a color wheel. And well what it does too, this is the cool part. Uh so I took this sample that I wanted to uh this part that I wanted to use, because you, you don't use any other colors except these. Mm -hmm. You can grind them up, you can shift them or whatever, but they all come from this spot on the color wheel where they work well together. Uh, so you're not looking at things on the physical color wheel. You know, you're just using this set of colors here. So what I did is I took my colors in here, and I created another one called Pal. Well, I call it Pal. Let's put my palette. I'll make it a different color. Blue. So what I would do is I would go in here and always with this, use a factory brush at 100 so you get your truest color. The only time I advise against that with like a painterly brush is if your background color is the local color for the piece you're working on. If that makes sense? Like. Uh, if you're working on a background that has like a base sky blue and you and you made a palette on top of that and that color is like slightly opaque over that blue, you can use that color because that um, uh, that environmental color is based around that blue, that local color, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. If I'm using that term correctly. <laughs> so... Well, I like to you know, start going through here, picking these colors. Make a couple warm colors here. If anybody has any questions, feel free to ask. Yeah, nice. That's probably gonna be my brightest yellow there, something like that. Uh, another thing I like to do too is I, I like to take um, maybe a color that I'm gonna be working on, like a base color, maybe darken it a little bit. So I can see those colors a little bit better. Actually, what I should do is this. So I'm not influenced by that gray. Let's well, say I'm going to start out with these, these colors here in this palette. And if I need any more colors, I just go back to this. And I say, I need a green or whatever. Then I'll go in here and find this green, which actually I need to create. So that's going to act as a green. Put it like that. It's nice. It's like you can like pull colors from that without like actually being like, oh my god, does this match this and whatnot. It's really nice. Um, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes what I like to do is I'll take a, a palette
take it, uh, I'll duplicate it, and then I'll click on that. And I'll go to adjustments. Uh, let's go to brightness contrast, okay? So we have this palette, and even if you change the brightness and contrast or hues, they're all still going to be in the same family, if that makes any sense. So, like, I'm going to choose to brighten these up a little bit. And I'm going to remember 65. Just in case I need to pull more colors from there. And what's really nice is if I use this palette to the left, I can borrow from the palette on the right. So what I'm going to do is take all these, merge them, make that blue. Uh, I'm very um, anal about like merging my layers and making copies and stuff. So you don't have to make as many layers that I make. I'm just I'm just me. That's what I do. <laughs> so sorry about that. Um, so what I want to do is go under these clean lines here. Uh, this is the only time I'd probably advise uh, against using the multiply function um, for this, especially if you don't have any gray tones. I would just kind of leave your line work the way it is uh, digitally, I think, I would say. Excuse me. So I'm going to take one of these blues here. I kind of like that purple, too. Kind of to that color. Let's make it darker. So I'm just going to pull it down like we're adding black to it. So I like that. Um, one of the things that helps me out here is move these references. Over. Let's see. Move these guys over. Kind of in my way right now. <laughs> All right. For the next part, we've got our uh, we got our colors picked. Um, we have our background color here. Uh, and my, what I like to do, um, is, man, this saved my bacon so many times too. I like to put a layer underneath here. You see, we got our clean lines layer. And this is more of a base layer for me. We're going to call it base color. We're going to take this, and I'm just going to drag it across here. Are we doing a color drop? Is that what's happening? Yeah. Actually... What am I doing? I need to work bigger than that. Here we go. Yeah, you, you don't even have to give a shit about being careful at this point. Like, this is just... Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's a technical term, by the way. No <laughs> <laughs> that, that part will be on the quiz. <laughs> How is it spelled? Use it in a sentence. You, you have to spell it correctly on your own. <laughs> All right. Um, one of the things that I like to do um, before I start painting, if you see there, like you see these little lines here, um, if you're going to use this method, make sure you close your lines and make sure all that your line work um, is within this block of color. So you can see I have like little holes there in the color block. Because this is the stuff you're going to just cut out and trim later. I know that um, if you were here for uh, Chris Yarbrough's demonstration, He's, uh, he's like, you know what? I am not afraid to use black in my paintings anymore, um, which is really awesome because I am still just one of those people. I, I try not to, 
But if I do, it's to blend it with another color, if that makes sense, like with the eyedrop tool. So, okay, cool. We got our base color here. I'm going to close this off here. I can give myself more space, by the way, because it allows you to just kind of use the brush strokes a bit more, bro uh, more broader. Um, and what I mean by that is, like, I like to take this base shape here. Um, but if you see this layer I just created titled Layer 4, if I hold the Alt button, it'll uh, mask it. It'll put it inside of this, this object here. So I can take this black and run it across, and it only stays within, stays with inside that base color that I created. And that again is hold the hold the Alt button in between the two layers. The uh, the top the, you put the layer on top that it's going inside of. Hold Alt. See how your icon changes. Click it, and then it'll work inside of there. So. Now what I'm going to do, I like to create a couple layers. By the way, if you click on the base layer and then click new layer, it'll create another layer inside of itself. So it's just if you ever need to use that or whatnot. Um, so right now, uh, I'm going to be done with my factory brush. It's crazy how far you get into the process before you start using actual brushes, brushes, you know, at least when I, when I do this. Um, one of the ones I like to use is my main pastel brush, um, just because I, I love the way it feels, uh, which is also in the, uh, in the folder under brushes, under Photoshop brushes, it's called the Atom Duff brushes. Uh, that's the set that it comes from. So with my palette up here, I know that this character wears black. Okay. Guess what? We're not going to be using black. So what I like to do, I just zoom out a little bit. This character, and again, I'm not going to worry about accuracy or anything. It's a little slow because I'm using a big brush here. See how I'm not using the black fully? I'm just like punching in like light versions of it. Like I got, I'm using black, but I'm not using it like as a solid. Like I'm, I'm using it more to blend my colors than anything. So I might not go any darker than like that. See now, and then I sample the color. You know, on the color wheel, it's not black. It's close to black, but it's not black. So that might act as my black in this. Yeah, I might want to throw in some of that too. Let's see, it's cool. I know, I'm just throwing it like just little blocks, little pieces. like a little tiny bit of a warm color. <laughs> little hints, just tiny, tiny hints, nothing big. Yeah. And with the uh, designs that try to keep the focus more up top, even if a uh, 3D artist is going to be doing the whole body, the focus is more up top, and, but I'll get more into that here in a little bit. So I got a nice little setup here just for now, like little base colors. And I'll start going in. See what I got here. Like, okay, 
And you guys might be like, holy shit, that's a complete mess. And I'm like, yeah, it's a complete fucking mess. <laughs> um, but, it, <laughs> but it gives you um, the opportunity to play around and sample colors. It's like you're still playing within your own rules. And we even got these guys up here. See, like, we haven't used this color. What is that color kind of here? Okay. What's that like if I lay this on top of it? Oh, cool. I get something else. Um, sometimes I just kind of start sampling colors like this. Because, again, it's all in the same family. So, actually, that's a sleeve, so that'll be dark. Remember, we, we want this to look like obsidian, but we're not going to worry about materials just yet. We're just kind of punching in little areas here. Remember that warm color we sampled earlier? We can't make it a blood red, but we can make it its own version of blood red. Now these colors... Oh, did you guys notice that at all? You see how I like took this? You see how that like if I brought that over, that would be a blood red. But since we're using these colors here in this palette, it still looks like a blood red with these colors. If that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. I'll take it down just a little bit more. See that right there. Taking little parts and like, okay, what would be red on this outfit? All right. Oops. Oops. It's not like me today. There we go. I like to start getting in here at this stage. I try to think of the lighting a little bit too at this stage. Right now, I'm just, I feel like I'm just replacing colors. Does anybody have any questions so far or comments or? I mean, I have questions and comments, but I'm like, I don't even know how to ask them right now <laughs> no please uh ask <laughs> no i'm just saying like i'm, I'm kind of zoning out on this trying to figure out what i want to ask about it like <laughs> i don't know if you notice in some cases i'm like kind of letting the colors underneath show a little bit and i'm using them like with her hair here I'll try something really quick, see what it looks like. I think it'd be awesome. That's another thing. Irises uh, or uh, uh, the whites of your eyes are not, uh, not irises, but the whites of your eyes are not uh, white. You guys already know that. They're usually like a darker color or whatnot. There we go. Those. Those edges there. Anybody have questions, comments so far? Maybe those 
those are red. It is, I can always change that later if I need to. Actually, no, I'm going to do this instead. No, I don't have because I want to show off the obsidian. Right now, I feel like I don't have a super dark um, color right now um, to kind of make that obsidian over here look like obsidian. But again, I'm not going to worry about the texture of it. I just kind of want that that dark that dark color. So let's see what we got here. That's pretty damn close to black, but I'm going to bring it down about there. Gonna be like our dark, dark color. This is, uh, if you press R, this is the rotation tool. Good job. Just little blocks the little spaces out. There we go. City and armor. Dark. Let's give her some hard space underneath here to shoulder. I don't want that to pop out. I want those earrings, all that shape leg to pop out. stack and shit in. If anybody has any questions or anything, just let me know. You see, like, the more and more I work, the it's like I'm not really sampling too many colors from our, my set palette. Because all my colors that I'm using at this moment are just from, they're from the same palette. It doesn't matter where I sample them. They're, like, they're still going to go together because I got them all from the same palette, if that makes any sense. Yeah.
have been wicked. I should have made her hair obsidian glass too. That would be really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, I'm just—I'm not even worried about details right now. I'm refining. It's just getting this shit on the paper. Sorry, <laughs> getting the colors laid out. I keep forgetting that we're recording. Oh my god, this is getting it all laid out on here. And uh, kind of see what we where we get as we regress here. Okay, I like that. I want to punch that up a little bit. So if we remember, she has also been in battles. She also has a scar on her face, too. I'm going to mark some places here. I'll start uh, refining, but uh, normally, like now, now these days, I'll like stay on this one layer here. It's like I'll keep this layer just to show you guys that again. To this, also, do you, does that make sense? Like how I'm building that color too, from from here to here. Does anybody have any questions about anything? Mm -mm. Okay. So, normally I'll take a new layer, like I did here, and then I'll start uh, to get in here closer. Oops. I'm about there, it's good for me. Uh, one of the things I like to do too, Take this here. I need to use my mouse. And then I'll go to view, I'm sorry, window arrange, then new window for clever kaiju character design. And what it does, it opens a new window for me. And if I need to see this character, let's see, full body, let's say I got to see her built like this, but I can't see her far away and work up close, so what I like to do is I'll do this. And normally I have my uh, second canvas open on a, on my monitor in front of me. It's usually not on the same uh, screen. So what I do now is I have my new layer here, and I just start going in here, and I just start like refining. Yeah, 
here. Yep. They're not completely black. That's good. I'm kind of just all over the place. I'm just sampling the colors around it. I'm also, if you notice, I'm kind of discovering where my uh, darker skin tones for this character are. I'm kind of running back over these dark areas here. Still, still kind of like having that underpainting show just a little bit. Some colors underneath there. I kind of like it when this, these brush marks show.
a lot of this line work, um, when it comes to this process, I end up painting over, um, depending on what style they want the art in. Uh, a lot of this line work, I usually end up painting over in the end. It's looking a little painterly. At this point, the client has selected the one design. Yes. And now we're uh, coloring it. They've get, they've given color suggestions. Well, already. Um, so yeah, they they picked a sketch that they like, or you know, a sample they like, and they wanted to go with this one. So now we're uh, doing our first color sample after they've approved our sketch. Because normally they have to approve your line work first before you even start painting, which I forgot to mention that by the way. So funny, I have, it's such a force of habit. I'm so used to like zooming out sometimes. I'm like, oh yeah, it's right there. <laughs> yeah, so right now, it's just about blocking, getting these colors in and refined. Being a bit more careful right now. Don't worry about this material. Before I start rendering, I'll just do something like this for the material. It's like placeholder. You know what? I lied. I'm going to start worrying about materials. Okay. Let's see. and say, oh, 
I might have to go a bit deeper with the blacks than what I've been than what I've been doing. So I'm gonna sample what the hell. Sample this color. Try to do it with my I don't want to get too black right there. That's perfect. Brings this out a little bit. We're that obsidian. Believe it or not, I am not using black. This is not full black that I'm using. Strangely enough. set this up. Well, Gary, it seems like um, there's already, like, you're getting close to where you could stop, depending on, like, for the, um, for the client, depending on you know, what their expectation is or, or what you're comfortable presenting to the client. But if you take longer, I mean, I'm sure you want to have a certain standard for your own work and also like the obsidian, and like there's there's information that's not fully communicated yet to the client that is important to your design, like the obsidian. Yes. So I guess it's a mix of like the standard of work you want to have and and uh, what information you haven't communicated yet in the design that's, that's part of what you're trying to do. So, yeah. Exactly. So if I turn this in, like right now, they'd be like the material doesn't look like obsidian. Yeah, they, yeah. Yeah. So like I'd have to kind of paint it up a little bit more, that kind of deal. Um, kind of like what I'm doing here. Um, they render it out just a little bit better or whatnot. Uh, sometimes like the concept art is rough, you know, it's rare, but sometimes you have to do it roughly. Uh, like when I did some like crypt TV stuff, I had to do it like these really uh, hard sketches, man. Uh, very, very like bold sketches. 
and then go off of those and paint over them. And even then, I was like doing everything in values. I wasn't even doing it like I'm showing you now. And then I co I color it after I got the values, or after the values were finished, I should say. Yeah. Um. What's the what's what exactly is the client using this for? Like, would this this is just the design for the character that their team would use in the game, or is it possible that they would use this in the game? Like, are they going to have two D art in the game that that is based on this, or is this meant for three D like skin rendering? Actually, honestly, this could be for either uh, for two D or three D. Um, if this were more 2D, it would be more, it'd be probably flatter color. Um, but this render here would probably be more for a 3D artist because it is like painterly and stuff. Yeah, they could use this to build their, their, you know, figure. Right. Exactly. It seems like that would... It's interesting to me that the client that you're working with is more interested, like they may be attracted to certain elements of your design and creativity that inspires them for what they're trying to do. But like when it's handed off to their artists or their designers in the, that are doing 3D, they're going to have a different idea of what they're looking for. Um, I mean, for instance, you kept like a you kept a pretty standard like body shape for her, which actually makes a lot of sense when I picture video games and like the 3D. I, I, I'm not going to have the right terminology for this, but there's certain body structures that they have that they can put skins on when they're using Unreal Engine or, or whatever engine. Like there's there's a certain expectation that's sort of kind of standard to a state. Um, and you've, you've drawn in a way that can I think that they can easily work from for that. Like the the basic uh, body body frame, yeah. They can unless the character has like yeah. an actually unique unique shape, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Something like that, honestly. Because I mean, the only difference is she's just like taller. She's eight feet tall. That's like the only thing. Yeah. Oh, shit. Don't draw on your wrong layers, guys. Oh, not, a no. good, <laughs> not a good look. But that's why I have a base layer, and I can do that right there. Turn all these back on. Have any questions so far? Um, what steps are going to be left to do in the coloring? Um, so what, after it's finish, finish, or the client? Uh, what you're going to finish on this before you present it to the client. And your steps in the coloring that you're doing now, painting. Um, the, the steps I would do it, are the full color version, like you see here. Uh, kind of keeps them focused just on one design. I try not to give them multiple options unless they ask for them. Uh -huh. but, uh, but yeah, it would be like this basic design, and then we would just build off of whatever feedback they had based on it. Because you already built the basic structure for the character by doing all the shape language stuff and the sketches and all that. If I'm doing this process, they want to go to production unless they have like uh, some color changes and that's it. I guess I was more asking when it comes to your painting process right now, uh, you've started to bring out 
some some shadows and um, he rendered some on the materials. Yeah. There's some communication of a light source, and um, I don't know how far you want to take it. Um, actually, it's kind of like, uh, you know, like I remember Chris Yarbrough said it's something like fake lighting. Um, that's kind of what I'm doing now. Usually, mine is just kind of like your average shot, like right around here. You know, you can see the hair here. It's kind of like upwards up here. So. Um, this for me is like material stuff, and that lighting is going to change once I get all this going here. Okay. And sometimes you can fake do that and then fake it with like, um, oh, not necessarily fake it, but just like put an overlay over it and then make certain areas of it look brighter, uh, push other areas back a little bit if needed. I think underpaints are so cool. My wife really t got me on underpainting, um, it, it, especially in my um, acrylic painting. She's just, you know, really changed my the way I look at acrylic acrylic painting. I had a an oil painting professor just beat underpainting my beat. Can't not do them now. You what? So I had a an oil painting professor that beat the idea of an underpainting into my head. So it's a force of habit at this point. Yeah, underpainting is great, man. I think it's such a traditional style of art that translates really well to the digital. Mm -hmm. so I think it's funny if people are like, oh no, I'll just do traditional. It's like, no, dude, like, like you can do the same shit digitally that you do traditionally. You just, you just don't get messy. Mm -hmm. See the difference, you know? Yeah, it's like, I would think like a, that'd be cool, kind of like a little red belt right here, kind of neat. But no, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna do belt. Do I have any questions, comments so far?
What kind of brush are you using? I am using a pastel blend brush. Oh, okay. And it is in the, uh, well, it's, it's actually on Photoshop, but it's in the Adam Duff brushes set. It, it looks a lot like the pastel sets in front of you, I was wondering. It has a, like, a lot of the wet brushes look a little hard, but it looked so soft. I was like, I wonder if that's pastel. Oh, yeah, and I treat it like I'm painting, though. Like, it's definitely, mm -hmm. uh, it's like, it's, if pastels in real life, I'm like, no. But I'm mm -hmm. like, this brush, I'm like, yes. <laughs> this one out. I wanted to show you that trick because it, it really helps out with my painting. I do stuff. like just time lapse this part <laughs> yeah For client stuff, whenever you're doing colors, do you kind of have the same layout where you've got maybe five different color variations before you would like spend this much time on a refined piece to show them in the end? Well, the, the trick is if it, uh, sometimes I can cut corners with layer styles. Mm -hmm. uh, say like if they did this, it would like, well, we you know, all the cool colors. So I just put a layer style over it that makes it a cooler version, or like yeah. all the red spots or whatever. So unless it's like completely different, like costume style, that I can use a base model for it. Sometimes like I would just draw her like just in her underwear or something, and then just put a costume on top of that. Like color you, do you show the client some color ideas like before you start this process? Sometimes they, a lot of the time they, they give me their their uh, suggestions for color and then I go off their palette. Okay. Yeah. But it's rare when they just send me like a palette themselves and they're like, just you know, do this or whatnot.
gonna show you guys backwards here. Obsidian has like this white version of itself. Let's see what we can do here. Realize how reflective the city is. That's where we have references. I love all the weird knowledge that I feel like artists have of like little tiny things because they've had to research it for a project or a commission. <laughs>
Yeah, I'm gonna kind of bounce off there. Get some black there. So here's my question for for everybody. Um, what 
are you guys working on right now and what project are you most excited about this year doing? Mm -hmm. professional. I've been getting a lot of stuff up on a, my Society 6 page. Do more pieces put in there. Get a shop going a little bit. Um, yeah. I've recently convinced my friends to all get together Saturday nights to do art stuff. And uh, I've, I've actually been sketching it out a little bit, but I have plans of turning this into a piece of some kind. Oh, cool. So that's what I'll be doing tonight. That's my project. That tongue is crazy. Yeah, it's uh, inspired by this little boy that I've done. And so, oh, cool. I like dogs. I like dogs and tongues and teeth. <laughs> I don't talk to you. I, I didn't do much. <laughs> I'm not, I don't know very much. So is that what you're most excited about also? I don't know if you answered that part. Yeah, I guess most excited um, to work on. To work on. I mean, the Society Six shop getting in some uh, tapestries of pieces that I've done and seeing just like a digital piece go from a little tiny iPad to a big old tapestry was really exciting for me. It made me I guess trust digital a little bit more because I'm always like, I don't know if I want to get completely into it because I still want to do like huge museum pieces kind of deal. I'm like, shit, I could probably do that on digital still. Just gotta get the right programs for it, and it'll be wildly easier and cheaper. So, I've just been excited by Procreate and digital stuff in general this year. All the possibilities. Anna, what about you? Um, um, well, currently, well, currently I'm working on, I'm working on some stuff, you know, class. stuff for class. Um, um, but I'm also, but I'm also kind of, kind of, you know, looking forward to applying, applying like a lot of what I learned, learned to my own, my own projects. projects. Yeah. Yeah. Especially, especially like for the, uh, for the summer, summer, I really I really want to try um, and, get and get that little that little comic, comic that I want to, you know, short you know, short, little short little comic done. done. I'm trying to I'm trying to you know you know you know before I you know before I start doing that, that make sure I have, make sure more, I have more of the characters you know. Well, fleshed out, out and, and all that, all that. Not, you know, just not just the characters, but also, but also like the scenery, you know, setting, setting, and all that setting stuff. And all that stuff. Yeah, I've got a world build. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you, got, you got, some, got a little bit of world building to do there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's one but of that's those. One of those um, it probably, it prob that's, probably that's probably gonna, gonna be like just like a standalone story of, of um, um, of that universe, of that, universe that, I, that I do want to expand, expand on. on. So, so. Uh, what, do you have like a, a, a goal like when you want to get out or like your uh, printing plans or is that just a bridge you're going to cross when you get to it? <laughs> Probably, more, Probably of more of a bridge. Uh, uh, I'll cross that, I'll cross that bridge when I get there. When I get there. We'll, we'll see. We'll, we'll see how, how, Oh, I, I gotta. I, see I gotta see where, how far, uh, how far I, get, I get. You know, you know. Yeah. No, no. I, I would, I, really, I would like really like to have, like to have that, that possibly ready, possibly to, go possibly ready to go for next vision con. Vision con. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna have it done this year, but, but yeah. Well, yeah. Like, we'll, like yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where it ends up. <laughs> Yeah, that's realistic though, like next vision con, like not this year but uh, you know, next year's as if we even have one this year. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So are, so are, I'm I'm curious, I'm, I'm curious if, if, are they still are they still gonna, gonna honor, honor everything? everything? Again? Again? Uh, 
from what I heard, yes. Because I because I at that point, you know, they don't have it this year. I still like I still only have a panel. I don't have a table, which is annoying. Which is annoying. But this year, this year it's fine. It's like you know, next you know, next year I would I would like to also have a table. Yeah. That's a very, that's a very game so that game, games and I can so share it so we have stuff both our stuff there. there. So if you know, we, may, yeah. we, may not, we may not have a whole lot, but we probably have, we probably have enough, enough, you know, between the, you know, between two, of the two of us to actually, actually have, a decent have a decent amount of stuff to sell. Stuff to sell. Yeah. Present my present tables this year. I just don't know how we're going to utilize them yet. I know we're all going to have merchandise. Uh, pretty sure. Uh, I just don't know who would be sitting where yet. But yeah, you're more than welcome to have friends at the the table, of course. Uh, we just got to figure out who's sitting where. <laughs> I've never been to like a VisiCon or Comic Con or anything like that before. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Went to a Pokemon tournament, if that counts. VGCs. <laughs> That's awesome. Were there cosplayers? Um, I mean, if you count like furry tails in your belt, then yeah, but nothing really. <laughs> nothing really crazy. I mean, it was more of a as a actual like competition. Was that con? Right. But no, we dressed up as trainers. Mm, no, you know what's funny though is that I I should have just dressed up because boyfriend and I went as a Misty and Ash, but we gender. So he's like pecking, sorry, uh, like six foot, you know, big old boy wearing little short shorts and red suspenders. Uh. And I'm dressed as Ash and. It's pretty great. We should have worn it, but I think Ben might have gotten kicked out <laughs> if he showed up wearing the costume that we have for him for Halloween. Uh -huh. Only I need to see that. <laughs> How's it going about you, man? I'm working on the next issue of Cat and Fiddle. Um, last year, uh, the, la the last issue I worked on, I had a lot of it to color after I finished drawing it. And that was really mundane to have to sit and color, you know, 40 plus pages. So uh, I'm coloring it as I go right now, which is nice because it's not that hard. It doesn't, it's not very difficult if you just do the page that you drew that day or the day before. Yeah. So I have seven pages done in January. At that rate, I'll have no problem finishing it this year. And it's not even like a, I'm not pushing it. That's just a, a pretty easy way to go. So that's what I'm working on right now. Um, I don't know what I'm most excited about. Um, my new issue has some challenging things in it to draw and to, to sort of choreograph the action. And so I do find myself feeling more uh, confident with more complicated um, action with multiple characters and so on. And that's, that's liberating. That's like a good feeling. So I'm kind of excited what I where I'm going with my cartoon, but as far as I don't know what I'm most excited about other than maybe like some I, I have time this year to do new things too. I guess I'm most excited to see what I end up doing. Yeah. What other projects I might do this year. Especially yeah, like uh, especially when it comes to the group, man, you've been helping out tremendously. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah. I, I have a question. Is Cat and the Fiddle an ongoing, or will there like be an actual end to Cat and the Fiddle? Um, nah, it's not, it's not like a solid end at the end of this story. It would, it, the idea is it could just keep going. So I'm not going to I'm not going to kill the cat off. Or if no, I no. do, <laughs> or if I do, there will be a back story opportunity. <laughs> Don't don't turn into Dave Sim. <laughs> oh, the guy that used to do Cerebus. Uh, Dave Sim, the guy that used to do Cerebus. He did like 300 issues of Cerebus, but he ended up kind of going crazy in the end. 
Yeah, yeah I've got an omnibus of that Cerebus stuff. I have not read it. It's too much. But I'm glad I have it. <laughs> So, I was going to show you guys just some stuff I would do while painting on top of it. Real quick. Let's see. But here's our line. I, usually, I have a line called PO for paint over. And that's just what I do. Let's see. So, I'm going to put some. I'm going to be. So that can make kind of like that chunky obsidian. Usually I don't do this till like later on in the illustration, but I'm just kind of showing you how I would handle this uh, rock material here. And I have to paint over the lines because I don't need them in the way that this light would kind of cover that end of it. But you would see that contour there essentially. The full French press of coffee finally came through. Also, too, instead of erasing your line work for it to lay on top, uh, I like to put a mask over it and use like a lighter brush. See, then you can kind of just brush over the uh, those areas. You're not losing anything because it's just the mask. Usually what I do, usually parts that are lit, I try to like this. Take down the line. I'm pasting it a little bit in those spots. You see like she's a little lit in there. Here and here. All through here. Okay, well, let's see. Kind of through there. I'm 
going to have to head out. I'll catch you later, Gary and everybody. All right, dude. Yeah. I'll see you later. Right. We got like 30 more minutes in here anyway. Awesome. So. And, and a recording, hopefully, too. So. All right. See you, Bye. Bye. So I want to show you uh, just real quick how I would kind of bring areas of the face out. Um, kind of using a, a style overlay or color overlay. Um, actually, before I do that, let me add something to the paint over part really quick. Uh, and I know this is a little rush, but we are pressed for time, so do this really quick. Pretend like we're putting a light over this. Sorry, this is unfinished. Um, so I'll take something like an overlay here. Um, and say we want like a warm light. Actually, you know what? No, we want to keep her cold. So let's put her in a cool light here. Notice I'm not going to go all the way over to white, though. I'm going to keep it probably right around there. Just like earlier, I'm going to zoom out a little bit. Not, not caring where, where it's going yet. There. Definitely want it on the shoulder. There. I... I'm going to zoom in now. Okay. It's kind of like what we did earlier. And now we go in and refine. This is a separate layer here. So we're not hurting our illustration. Uh, I want to use an eraser similar to my brush for this uh, just so it feels consistent That's more right there on the collar.
Look at this guy. Look at this guy. Oh my god. Look at this dude right here. How's it going, Nate? Hi, Nate. You might see Oh, he's muted. He's muted. Son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to pop in and say hi. I was hoping you guys were still going. Yeah, I got about 15 minutes or something left, man. It's good to see you. Everybody else is muted. We were recording. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> You're good, man. You're good. We, uh, I set up a description and uh, kind of follow these personal guidelines for for this piece here. Kind of showing them, like, um, what it's like when you deal with a client and something they'd ask for uh, character-wise or whatnot and how that process goes. Hopefully, hopefully someone has learned something today. <laughs> <laughs> you could do the handful of like locked-in shapes of color. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We did all that. <laughs> But the cool thing is, it is going to be recorded, so. Big gold man. Fantastic. Unfortunately, I'll have to duck out here shortly again, but I at least wanted to let you know that. I was thinking of you. Uh, well, thanks for stopping by, dude. It's good seeing you as always. It's just so weird. Uh, it's <laughs> like, oh, hi. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's all good, dude. No, I'll look, at, I'll, I'll look forward to the recording. But you guys have an excellent week. We'll talk to you. I'll talk to you soon. All right, man. I'll see ya. So right about here, I'll probably use like a white or something really close to it, like dangerously close to white. So let's see. Right about like there. This is always my favorite part to watch in speed paints, is all the little highlights in the end. I know, it's always fun to do that part. I like this uh, phase two, um, or the stage, I should say, because you can like draw, or you can like draw and paint like extra parts in, and you know, see the painted versions of your line work compared to like your 
you know, cleaner line work from earlier. Sorry, Sorry I'm not rendering the bottom part much, guys. It's just kind of to save time here. would do after this I would take I would go back to this layer down here the base color layer and I would use the factory eraser for this uh, not the brush eraser I was using earlier uh, this is the part where you cut you go in you just start Packing pieces out. Start cleaning up your edges. Find your line work. Cool part about this though is that I can erase all of this here, but if I went back and scribble more color block there, all that information is still inside of there. Like all those other layers of color here are still inside of this. So if I expand it, it's still going to be there. You'll see it. See our overlay layer is on top. It's not inside the shape, so we're gonna we'll have to trim that too. took a cue from Haley with that hair shape there. So is there anything that I've done in this process so far that you have questions about or don't understand or... I don't understand how you can use so many damn layers. I'm looking at it giving me stress. <laughs> it makes things so much easier, too. I'm sure it's easier with uh, clients when they want just, like, certain little things changed. Yeah. It's a smart move. It just hurts my heart. And usually these in here, these are the layers inside here. Mm -hmm. like normally, the, this would be like this. Right. You would just have that. You'd have that line layer. Then you have that paint over. And then mm -hmm. paint over there. 
So it stays pretty basic. I just kept them separate for this demonstration, so it kind of looks like a lot. We need more uh, creature design prompts for the pen and click. Let's keep yeah. it. I want to draw some beasties. Yeah, creature design sounds good. I, I'll, I will definitely throw that in there. I love the way that comes out once you trim the edges there. Mm -hmm. Guys, I'm going to stop in a few minutes. Um, this is, man, I kind of want to like finish this just kind of on my own time. <laughs> <laughs> the armor, her gauntlets look super dope. Thanks, dude. Yeah. This is kind of like the, uh, actually I kind of like listening to music and just doing that because it's not necessarily mindless, but it's like, it's kind of like relaxing. It's kind of satisfying. To trim it all away. Yeah. Oh yeah. I think it's the satisfaction of doing something really, really easy, but getting like, like big results out of it. So it's just, right. it just tickles that little part on your brain that produces the good chemicals. I was actually really nervous about giving this presentation. No. I was like, oh my God, I don't know. It's like, are they, are they going to learn anything or not? <laughs> the little like tips and tricks you have, like the little shortcuts of just being in the industry for a while. I've, I've actually written little tiny notes and pocketed it. <laughs> nice. As, as you should, man. I, I just hope someone can learn something from what I'm just showing or doing. So. That's no, the only question. Goal here. no question of it. <laughs> Also, if you didn't, like, even teach anything brand new, like, just watching someone's process is educational in itself, because you just pick up mm -hmm. the things that they've been seeing. So, regardless, thank you for doing it. <laughs> thank you guys for listening, man. I really appreciate it. This is uh, always fun for me to do, and this is kind of a new way I've been approaching this, too, lately, so to teach that as well is, is really really fun and really cool and i'm glad that it worked out for you guys but um i can always come back next week and, and show you the rest but mostly it's just me rendering stuff uh and what it'd be like if i sent it out that kind of thing but um yeah this is how i how i do my process here let's turn the height chart back on there you go um She'd be trimmed out. Um, she would have a turnaround. And uh, yeah, so her spider casket. And actually, what I'll do is I'll just finish it up on my own time sometime and show it to you guys again.